Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us over the lunch hour for the second lecture in our University of Regina's 2021 Research with Impact Series. I'm Mark Budikoffer, Director of Advancement at the University of Regina, and I'll be leading us through the next hour where you'll hear from one of the university's leading researchers in mental health, Dr. Nicholas Carlton. But before I introduce him, I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are gathered virtually on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the ancestral lands of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Dakota peoples, and the homeland of the Métis, on whose territories the University of Regina resides. As a parent of two young daughters, I feel this acknowledgement is important for them to grow up aware of the history and the future of this land in which we live. The University of Regina's alumni department, together with Lifelong Learning Center, is pleased to be able to virtually offer the Research with Impact series. Whether this is your first time joining us or you're attending all of the sessions, I hope you'll leave today wanting to come back for more. Now, I should point out that these sessions are being recorded and will be posted on our website so that others can watch the presentations or you can watch them again and share them with your friends and family if you wish. You'll see that the link to the alumni website in the chat if you'd like to access the video later. And now I'd like to introduce our second speaker in the University of Regina's Research with Impact series, Dr. Nicholas Carlton. Thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Carlton is well known throughout Canada and worldwide for his research and collaborative work to support the mental health of first responders, and other public safety personnel. He's a professor of clinical psychology at the U of R, a registered doctoral clinical psychologist in Saskatchewan, and currently serves as a scientific director at the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment, also known as CIPSERT. Dr. Carleton has made it his life's work to understand human response to trauma and the development of post-traumatic stress disorder. He's been working tirelessly to connect PSP leaders across Canada, researchers and policymakers to develop and mobilize the knowledge needed to build better support PSP mental health. For his efforts, Dr. Carlton has received several prestigious awards and acknowledgements. In fall 2020, he was accepted as a fellow in the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, which is an association of Canada's top ranked scientists and scholars in health sciences. He's an inducted member of the Royal Society of Canada's College and received the 2020 Royal Mock Geislin Prize for Mental Health Research. Today, he'll be talking with us about CIPSERT's past, present, and future activities. Following his presentation, we will have 15 minutes for a question and answer session. Hertha from Lifelong Learning Centre will be moderating the Q&A. As you listen to Dr. Carlson's presentation, please send your questions in the chat feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Hertha will share them with Dr. Carlton shortly after his presentation ends, and we'll do our best to get to as many of the questions as time allows. And now, over to you, Dr. Carlton. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here uh, this afternoon and so glad to have so many people uh, able to take time to join us today. We're gonna to talk about a lot of things that are near and dear to my heart and that I've been working on for many, many years now. At a very high level today, though, we're gonna talk uh, about a lot of the tremendous successes that we've had so far in our collaborative efforts to try and help manage PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other mental health injuries among our public safety personnel all across Canada, certainly here at home, and even around the world. So I want to start with just some brief disclosures. Uh, I am a professor of psychology here. I am serving as a scientific director. I have no relationships with commercial interests. Uh, my research is supported by federal and provincial foundations and, uh, and taxpayer dollars in a variety of different ways, as well as nonprofit organizations. So uh, I think that's an important precursor to a lot of the things that we're going to discuss because it sets the, the framework for, for a lot of the foundation uh, that I think is important to understand everybody's commitment to protecting PSP mental health. Let's start at a much broader, higher level, though, for a second. Let's talk about what we mean when we talk about potentially psychologically traumatic events. Sometimes we refer to these in shorthand as traumatic events. Really, it's a host of different events that we can experience that typically involve uh, severe harm or risk of severe harm to oneself or others, it involves uh, sexual assault, sexual trauma, it involves uh, mass injuries. 
and whether those exposures themselves are going to cause a psychological injury changes for each of us. It changes for us over time. It changes depending on our recent experiences. It changes between us as individuals. And so that's why we say potentially psychologically traumatic event to differentiate physical trauma, so actual tissue damage from psychological trauma, and to really respectfully recognize that an event is potentially psychologically traumatic because what might be traumatic for me today might not be tomorrow, and what might be traumatic for me might not be for you. I also like to highlight the idea that as a species, we're pretty resilient and adaptable. And I think we've all seen that uh, over the course of the last 18 months in particular. Most stressors, even protracted ones, are typically not overwhelming, and most of us can cope, and most of the time we're able to continue through. But that doesn't make that universally true, and it does not necessarily mean that we don't at different times need help to manage our experiences with PPTE or other traumatic events. So let's talk about how often we experience these. Well, in the general population, and by that I mean across all Canadians, there's some pretty good estimates with respect to how often we would be exposed to a PPTE event. So for women and men, your specific data is there before. And women, it's around 1% to around 42%, if you look at the broadest range of data that we have, would be experienced to either directly or indirectly to at least one PPTE in their lifetime. A more conservative estimates suggest it's somewhere between 20% and 24%. And for men, you see, it's about the same. So you've got these broad and conservative ranges. What this means is a fair number of us are going to be exposed to at least one such event at some point in our lifetime. As a result of being exposed to those kinds of events, it is possible that some people at some points might develop a mental health condition and that mental health condition might follow that exposure to a PPTE. And if it does, we might call it a post-traumatic stress injury. And a post-traumatic stress injury or a PTSI is how we refer to a variety of different mental health challenges, even mental health disorders that might occur after having been exposed to one or more PPTE. And so most commonly we focus on post-traumatic stress disorder because in part the names are similar and because we can see that direct link. And there's good reason to do that. After a PPTE, that possibility that you develop a post-traumatic stress disorder is certainly there. But if you take a look at the 12 month prevalence rates, they range somewhere between zero and 3%, depending on who you ask uh, in the literature. But it's also not the only disorder that can occur. Repeated exposures to PPTE or even a single exposure might also result in generalized anxiety disorder or major depressive disorder or panic disorder. So all of those are possibilities. The one we focus on is PTSD. And the thing to keep in mind is that for the most part, most of us, despite being exposed to these kinds of events, end up being quite resilient and bouncing back. So let's talk a little bit about where I end up focused uh, on a lot of my research, uh, certainly for the last decade or so. For most of us, when a PPTE occurs, when we're exposed to one of these potentially psychologically traumatic events, one of the first things that we do is we pick up a phone and we call 911. And there's good reason for us to do that because we're reaching out for help. And when we call that 911 number and we reach out, so we've been exposed to a fire or a car accident or mass shootings or, or any kinds of violence, or we need help for something, we call 911 and it, it sets off a trigger series of events. So you talk to somebody who's working in public safety communications and they then could choose to dispatch help for you. And the people that we dispatch are people that are regularly engaging with potentially psychologically traumatic events, either directly or indirectly, as a function of helping protect us when we call 911. So before we get into some of those details, and, and I do want to talk about those, I think it's a good point to remind everybody we've been trying to navigate how to manage our exposures to psychologically traumatic events for at least 100 years. And for the last 40 years, uh, we've been looking at trying to manage post-traumatic stress disorder. So we've had that as a disorder for the last 40 years. And as part of a, a really fantastic series that was actually led by uh, Dr. Raymond Blake, uh, it was a centenary reflection series. We actually look into the history of PTSD in the last 100 years 
of our developing our understanding of what happens with PPT and with the fallout that can occur after an exposure. So if you're interested, I encourage you to visit our website. You can hear a, a very, uh, very nicely assembled lecture. Uh, unfortunately, they used me as the performer for the lecture, so you'd have to hear me some more. But it's a fascinating 100-year history, and the last 40 years have been particularly interesting and really, I think, helped to set the framework for a lot of the challenges that we're going to talk about that are faced by our public safety personnel. So in 2015, the Prime Minister mandated the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness to work with the Minister of Health to develop a coordinated national action plan on PTSD. And they specifically focused on a group of people called public safety personnel. These are the ones at the other end of the phone who are coming to help us when we experience one or more potentially psychologically traumatic events. And as part of that, they began a, a series of events that have led us to, I think, a lot of interesting successes and a lot of fantastic opportunities going forward. They defined a group of people called public safety personnel as including but not limited to border services officers, public safety communicators, correctional workers, firefighters, indigenous emergency managers, operational intelligence personnel, paramedics, police at all levels, and search and rescue personnel. And in doing this, they really recognize that you have a broad community of people that are regularly engaging with exposures to potentially psychologically traumatic events as they protect the rest of us. Now, these people are unique with respect to a lot of the challenges that they face. First of all, most of the challenges that they face are, are different than anybody else. Let's, let's talk a little bit about relative to military. So it's not better or worse. I wanna underscore that, it's different. So our military are here at home and then they get deployed to what is for them a very unsafe zone. And then they get brought, get brought back, pardon me, to what is the very safe zone here in Canada. And they do those deployments typically for less than 240 days. And the reason that they keep those to less than 240 days is because research coming out of World War I and World War II suggested very early on that 100% of people exposed to 240 days of those kinds of PPTE style stressors come back symptomatic. So we had to be careful about the deployment length. So our PPSP are very different than our military because our military are kept safe at home by our PSP just like the rest of us are. But for our PSP, we deploy them to what is for them an unsafe zone. And we leave them deployed there for 25 years. And that's a very, very long, very big, tall order. They're also different relative to each other. We ask them to manage protection, enforcement, rehabilitation. These are very challenging things. And we've seen a lot of those challenges in the last few years. They're also different in how they get deployed, in how they're exposed to events, in the responsibilities they have in managing the events and in the amount of certainty that they have. And they're also different in that they're deployed out in the real world all the time, which means there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty involved in every single day that they engage in providing us protection. And they're also different relative to history. So we're increasingly asked them to fulfill more and more complex roles. So a police officer is not just a police officer anymore. They are also hoping that the police officer can be a, a mental health interventionist, that they can be a social worker, that they can provide interim supports. Whatever it is that we don't provide as part of our social communities, it is our PSP who ultimately fill that gap. So if we're missing part of our social network, they're where the buck stops, so to speak, because they're the ones that are going to manage those challenges for us. The University of Regina became quickly involved in uh, the National Action Plan development after 2015 and launched the development of a Canadian Institute specifically for public safety personnel research and treatment to support their mental health and their well-being, but also that of their leaders and their families. And we wanted to do it by coordinating the researchers across Canada and the research information from across the entire world so that we could mobilize more effective solutions to support PSP stakeholders, to support our government decision makers, to support our researchers, and to ultimately improve their well being. We started that by coordinating academics, researchers, and clinicians who were interested across the entire world. And I, I like to give a little head nod. Uh, because we started so small and we grew so fast. Uh, it was actually begun uh, back at Memorial University was when we had our official launch. And there were five academics that sat together uh, with a host of administrative supports and some public safety personnel and said, yes, we think we can actually do this thing. And so we did that at Memorial University. And the, uh, the cute comment that was made repeatedly was, well, they're sort of like the five puffins uh, because the puffins happened to be nesting at that time and you could see them. So it was quite spectacular. 
Since then, we've grown the network quite dramatically. And there have been a tremendous number of people that have been actively and eagerly seeking to be engaged so that they can also provide better supports and better help for our public safety personnel. We also needed help from the public safety personnel themselves because there's really very little point in us jumping in as academics and researchers and clinicians to try and take a top-down approach. We really needed to coordinate and collaborate with them and that's something that we, we try to do regularly and we think we've done a pretty good job but we needed to be able to marshal the resources at a national level. We needed to be able to begin coordinating those efforts. So our public safety steering committee works with us and they have representatives from all of the major public safety personnel agencies across Canada. So you'll have groups like the Canadian Association Chiefs of Police, and then they have a parallel group, the Canadian Police Association. And those groups help to provide us with direction, steering, information, they support our knowledge translation efforts, and they help us to understand how we might best be able to effect change that is positive for these diverse members of our society. Public Safety Canada then operationalized the Institute as part of the Government of Canada's 2018 federal budget and made a five-year funding commitment that we're of course hoping will be renewed, but it's a five-year funding commitment to build a national research consortium between the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and SIPSERT. They invested $15 million that CIHR managed as part of our consortium to fund diverse public safety personnel focused research. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. They also funded $5 million to create the National Mobilization Hub because it actually takes a fair amount of effort to coordinate and mobilize academics, researchers, clinicians, and public safety personnel across the country and make sure that we're transmitting the best available research to all of those people so they can then propagate it to all of their people so we can make change. And they invested $10 million to fund a pilot project using internet cognitive, internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy that would be tailored very specifically for public safety personnel in Saskatchewan and Quebec. I'm very excited to showcase all of this with you as we go forward today. So let's talk first about the catalyst grants. In 2019, we awarded 22 different one year long catalyst grants. And CIHR administers those throughout the entire country. Uh, the projects span a variety of institutions, researchers, and focus points all across Canada. And they touched on different aspects of mental health for all of our public safety personnel. And the knowledge translation associated with that started in October 2020 and, and is ongoing. But if you visit our website, you can see an entire webinar series associated with all of the outcomes in the knowledge translation there. And we were very privileged, all of us as researchers, in that in, I think, all of the webinars, we were actually able to have public safety personnel work alongside us in providing the information and the results of the studies back to the public safety personnel communities. And I think that's so important to make sure that it's relevant and accessible for everybody. We also awarded three three-year-long team grants, eight of them in total, in March 2020. And those projects are all underway. They're longer, larger scale projects that are designed to have uh, a larger series of impacts to benefit public safety personnel. Some of those, as you can imagine, have been delayed in different ways. And we'll talk maybe briefly about some of those, but they were delayed as a function of COVID-19 uh, in some cases. In many cases, they were able to continue working, but one way or another, we're very excited about the outcomes from all of them. Part of what we were tasked to do as SIPSERT was begin doing research because the first thing we noticed as part of the 2015 mandate and then the 2016 National Action Plan was that we were actually missing a tremendous amount of information on all public safety personnel. And so we very rapidly began doing a variety of research projects to fill in some of the most critical gaps with at least stopgap measures so we could then build forward towards better solutions as funding became available and more researchers became engaged. One of the first things that we were able to sort out was clarification about just how often our PSP are exposed to these potentially psychologically traumatic events. Do you remember what I said at the beginning? Most of us might be exposed to one, maybe two of these events in our entire lifetime, but nobody ever asked PSP, how often are you exposed? And it should make sense to all of us that since they're the ones we call for for help when we're having a PPD, they're likely exposed to a lot of them. And I don't think any of us appreciate just how often. As you can see in the chart here, you'll see on the far left-hand column, a variety of different potentially psychologically traumatic events, how often public safety personnel were ever exposed to them, how frequently they were exposed to them, and then what the worst event was from their perspective, and then how often those events were associated with PTSD. So as you can see, most of public safety personnel have at least been exposed one time to almost all of 
the different potentially psychologically traumatic events. And in fact, most of them have been exposed 11 or more, more times. And when we actually checked the qualitative data that we had from this study, their report was 11 or more times. You, you put the ceiling way too low. By the time we finished talking to them, it was closer to thousands, if not tens of thousands of exposures. So just imagine the dose difference there, if you will, between the general population being exposed one or two times and our public safety personnel being exposed thousands of times. They also reported a lot of diversity in which events they felt were worse, were worst, pardon me, for them so far. But we are also able to identify that almost all of the events were statistically significantly associated with an increased risk for screening positive for post-traumatic stress disorder. So this told us a lot, told us that they are exposed tremendously often. It told us that there's not one or two specific events that we have to worry about, but that in fact, all of the events can cause injuries. And it told us that our public safety personnel experience them as worst or not worst events in a variety of different ways, which made it a lot more complicated for us to provide them with the necessary supports going forward. We also, for the very first time, got a handle on, well, okay, just how much are they experiencing these mental health injuries, these post-traumatic stress injuries? How frequently are they in trouble? And um, we were able to compare the, uh, the data that we had to diagnostic data from the general public. And here's what we found. If you take a look at the chart here, you can see, or the table here rather, you can see that in the general population, it's around one to three and a half percent, give or take a little bit at any given time have PTSD. But for our public safety personnel, when we did the first check of this, it was 23%. So you're talking orders of magnitude higher. And you see a similar pattern for all of the other disorders that we were able to screen for. And you see that across our different public safety personnel, they are all high. There's certainly some variation in, in which ones are more or less likely to have difficulties with what, but they're experiencing rates of mental health injuries that are orders of magnitude larger than the general public. And so that's a serious concern for all of us. And we think it might be related to their regular exposures, at least in part. We were also curious about suicide and difficulties with suicidal ideation, planning and attempts. It's very difficult to measure suicidal behaviors among our public safety personnel for a variety of reasons. So deaths by suicide are actually really hard for us to track. It doesn't mean it's impossible, it's just hard. So we track reports of ideation, planning and attempts because they're the best predictors that we have. And even then they're not great predictors because you could have a history of suicidal ideation, planning and attempts and never die by suicide. You could also not have any history of those three things and still die by suicide. So in the general population, you can see the estimates there from Stats Canada about ideation, planning and attempt for the past year and for lifetime data. And when I say less than 1%, in Canada, 13 out of every 100,000 people die each year by way of suicide, which means that it's far less than 1%. It just gets very difficult for us to measure at those uh, low base rates. And also it gets very difficult then uh, for me to present it in a chart. If you then take a look though at our public safety personnel, in the past year, their rates are in many cases double or more that of the general population for the numbers of them who contemplated dying by suicide, who created a plan to die by suicide, or who made an attempt to die by suicide. These numbers are very concerning for, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which being that our public safety personnel are far more equipped to die by suicide than the rest of us are. So for a police officer, if she or he is at risk and they decide they're going to die by suicide, the distance between that ideation, the planning and the attempt can be the distance from their hand to their hip. Whereas for many of the rest of us, a very lethal suicide attempt can take more effort and there can be more opportunities for someone to intervene or for chance to protect us. So we're very worried about that. We're also very worried about the fact that of all of the people who would be able to make a death by suicide look like an accident, it would be our public safety personnel. Because part of their job, unfortunately, is to look after the situations where we have people who we lose to suicide. So for all of these reasons, and for many more, we think that it's an extremely important area for us to focus on, because we want to protect the people who are protecting us. Again, because we think in providing those protections, they're actually putting themselves at increased risk for their own mental health injuries. We talked to a lot of the public safety personnel, but we also got a lot of feedback from them. And here's some of the things that we learned out of the qualitative data. First of all, there were significant and consistent reports of concerns that they had that they were alienated from their past selves. That they were no longer the same person that they were and they weren't always happy with the new person they had become because they had seen so many things. They often felt powerless, that they were not safe and that they were hopeless. 
And these are some of the most heroic people in our societies. These are the ones who come in to provide us with power, to provide us with safety, to provide us with hope. And so that's very difficult to hear that so many of them struggle with those same issues. And many of them felt forsaken by their employers and by their government and forgotten about by their communities, largely because we, we don't get to see them all the time doing the things that they do best when we're thrilled. We typically see them when things go very wrong for themselves or for someone else. There's also the two major things that they asked for. And the most common thing they asked for is, for me, quite heartbreaking. They didn't ask for more resources or more money. The most common thing they asked for was to be recognized for the contributions in the they're making to our societies and the challenges they face in making those contributions. And that's very hard, I think, for a lot of us to hear because they're putting their lives on the line in many cases to protect us. And they could use more resources, there's no question. But the first thing they asked for was something that's free for us to give, and that is recognition. The second thing they asked for was demonstrable national, provincial, and municipal support to help protect them so that they can do a better job of protecting all of us. We also heard from them that there's a lot of suspicion that people are abusing the system, that there's stigma problems, that anybody who is taking time to, to address their mental health needs is being judged by their colleagues. We also heard from them that they think understaffing is increasing the scrutiny of others. So if you need to take somebody off work so that they can get the mental health supports they need to protect them against a mental health injury or to hopefully protect them against dying by suicide, it necessarily means that you're short staffing some groups thereafter or asking for overtime or asking for longer shifts. And these are not groups of people for whom we have deep benches to begin with. They don't have a whole lot of extra people to backfill which means that when they're asked to protect their own mental health and look after their own health in general, they do it at a cost because we haven't resourced them in the ways that we could have. They also reported fiscal constraints that are necessarily potentiating stigma when people take time off, largely because again, they need more access to resources so that those very thin lines of PSP who are protecting all of us can do a better job of protecting themselves and they're in a more sustainable job of protecting all of us. So in addition to the difficulties that they were facing with potentially psychologically traumatic events, they also reported that they were having all kinds of organizational difficulties and that those organizational difficulties appeared to be associated with mental health conditions as well. A lot of these do come back to the same kinds of challenges though, the same challenges with resourcing and having enough personnel and being asked to do too much with too little too often. And so this is all pre COVID-19 data. Everything that I've heard since uh, suggests that these problems would not have gotten better as a function of COVID-19. So for example, there was a, a pretty famous news article that came out where in one instance, as part of managing the COVID-19 pandemic, the Toronto Police Service had to pull 500 people off of their front lines. Well, that would have necessarily increased the strain on the entire system while they busily checked for COVID-19 and got their people back to work safely. But if you take a look at all of the different challenges above and beyond those psychologically traumatic events that they're facing, you can see for those of you who are researchers that the adjusted odds ratios there indicate that they are all statistically significantly associated with things like PTSD and in fact, any other mental health disorders. And a lot of those are opportunities that we have as communities to better support all of those organizations so that they can do a better job of supporting their people. But that requires a community effort. It's not something that we can just task them to do on their own. It's something that we need to support their leaders in and their organizations in doing. We also saw evidence that there were operational difficulties and those operational difficulties are also things that I expect got worse over the course of COVID-19. And those operational difficulties were also associated with PTSD and other mental health disorders. And these are things that we all have challenges with. So managing your social life outside of work, sure, that's a work-life balance challenge. And any of the professors who are on the line today, uh, I'm, I'm sure we all share an understanding, if, if not everybody, that that's difficult. It became more difficult with COVID-19 for all of us, as we've heard from innumerable people, but it was always more difficult for our public safety personnel. So if you imagine a paramedic who's gone out for dinner, for example, or a police officer, or really any of the PSP, if something goes wrong for somebody at another table while they're having dinner, they're not going to sit there quietly. It's not who they are. So they're going to get up and they're going to manage that situation, which makes it difficult for them to ever not be on. And that was before COVID-19. So shift work, overtime, constantly being on, being in the public eye, feeling like you're always being judged, 
that's a lot of stress and strain that we put on top of people who are already trying to manage extremely challenging situations, situations that we would generally accept for the rest of us would be enough on their own. So when we're recognizing these extra challenges, it really helps us to understand the compounding problems that our PSP are facing in trying to protect all of us. As part of that, we've heard lots of people that have proposed all kinds of peer support related or crisis focused psychological interventions. We should be able to do something to help. And I agree, we should, and we can, and we are. But historically, a lot of these interventions have been built ad hoc, which means there hasn't been a lot of research done. There's not a lot of pre and post evaluations. There's lots of inconsistencies. So that's creating a limited series of, of strength of evidence for any of the programs that are available. So can we do something? Can we train? Can we intervene? Can we do things? Sure, probably. But if one of the PSP leaders says to me, Nick, which of these things should I administer? Because we only have so much time and so much money to administer these things. We don't have an evidence base yet that allows me to say, do this one. This one should help. That's something that we've got a long way to go on and we need their coordinated support and collaboration in order to eventually build those answers. But in the interim, we still need solutions to try and protect these people's mental health. What we do know is that so far, it looks like just about anything that you do tends to help a little bit. And that's good news. But it also means we need to do a bunch of expectation management. And the reason we need to do that expectation management is that mental health is never going to be a one and done, especially for people that we're asking to step into the line of challenge all the time, as we are with our public safety personnel. It's not gonna be one and done. It means that we need ongoing campaigns. We need to invest in their mental health on a regular basis. And we need to do so, so that we are providing opportunities to build resilient people and resilient organizations so that they can better support all of us. But in the interim, just attempting to help seems to, in general, be helpful. But we need to do a lot better than that if we wanna get those numbers of mental health injuries down and do a better job of trying to protect against death by suicide. We also found out all kinds of information so far about who PSP would access as resources. And as it turns out, they don't wanna come see me first. And I'm okay with that, I, I can understand that. What they're more likely to do actually by leaps and bounds is talk to their spouses or their friends. So of all of the different people who they would access as first line mental health resources, they talk to their spouse or their friends. And that should make sense because that's probably pretty common for all of us. That also means though, that the front line for mental health for protecting our public safety personnel, there's a huge opportunity there with spouses. And that also means families. That should make a lot of sense to everybody. Your spouse is probably the first one to notice if you're drinking more alcohol, if you're skipping exercise, if you're grumbly at home, because let's face it, they're the ones that we spend the most time with. That also means though, that they're an opportunity. We can provide them with training. We can provide them with skills. We can provide them with psychoeducation and information. And perhaps they can then help with earlier interventions or to increase how rapidly people seek care when they need it. But we've got a lot of work to do yet on figuring out exactly how best to do that. Because having a family member present to you that you need help can also be challenging depending on your relationship. There's also a host of different collaborative projects that are going on across the country right now. And I could, in fact, and I'd be delighted, in fact, to spend an hour or more with you on each of these different projects. But these are just the ones that the university, well, not only ones, but these are just some highlights from the University of Regina. We're pilot testing different psychoeducation programs like the Road to Mental Readiness. And we're doing that with local PA, public safety personnel in Saskatchewan. We're evaluating different intervention programs from around the world. We're building a new research project that will provide research training because we wanna give all of our public safety personnel and their leaders and their families better tools for evaluating research and for demanding better evidence-based solutions. We're trying to better understand moral injuries because our public safety personnel are often asked to make incredibly complicated and difficult moral choices that are almost unimaginable for the rest of us. And so how do we make sure that those moral choices that they're making are not causing injuries thereafter? Probably one of the largest studies that we're leading here that we should all be very proud of as, uh, as members of Saskatchewan, but even as Canadians, is the Longitudinal Study of Operational Stress Injuries for the RCMP. Again, we could spend an entire hour, two, three hours talking about that fantastic study. But the RCMP are leading a massive initiative to try and begin assessing what kinds of interventions, tools, and measures would be most useful. So we start testing them at the beginning of their cadet training, we follow them throughout the cadet training, and we follow them for five years thereafter because it's gonna provide a data set that is unprecedented. It allows us to build real solutions. 
Building all of that allowed us to build a series of protocols that were some of them personnel based and some of them technology based. And thanks to one of those Canadian team grants that I mentioned, we are now taking all of those protocols from the RCMP project and we are seeing if we can port them over. So we're working with our provincial, with members of our provincial police forces, firefighters, communicators and paramedics, and we're bringing them together. Uh, many of them from right here at home in Regina so that we can test out what happens if we give them these protocols? What happens if we give them these tools? Can these tools be used to help them sooner than we ever imagined? And we certainly hope so. And we're starting those tests later this fall. So we're very excited to have those results in the coming year. We're also working on new peer support apps and new technologies to allow people to connect and communicate with one another because we keep hearing they wanna to talk to their friends and their peers. So we're finding ways to allow them to do that in safe evidence-based way with evidence-based solutions. So last but not least, let's talk very briefly about treatment. That internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy program that I mentioned. This is a fantastic program. Uh, it's being led by Dr. Heather Hedrestavopoulos, who's our principal investigator for this project. She's a world-renowned psychologist and spectacular researcher right here at home at the University of Regina. She's implementing cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a structured goal-oriented treatment, goal treatment that allows clients to develop skills that allow them to become healthy and stay healthy. It's very skills and solution focused and it helps them to improve their well-being by identifying and managing unhelpful thoughts and patterns of behaviors. It's one of the most evidence-based therapies that we have available today. A lot of PSP report to us that they don't seek care because of things related to stigma. They're worried they're gonna be judged if they go for mental health care. They're also worried about repercussions and they're worried about feeling and appearing vulnerable. And I can understand all of those things. And if you get the privilege of working with these people uh, on a regular basis, you're gonna see these professionals are just spectacular. And, and I can understand why they might have some of these challenges. There's also the logistical barriers, distance from services that are evidence-based and time constraints. Well, fortunately, ICBT allows us to work around some of those. It presents the material online. There's texts and engage, text, engaging images, video, audio. They do weekly lessons over a few months and they have access to a real therapist one or two times per week. And there was a substantial body of evidence before we started this project that said ICBT or Internet Delivered Cognitive Behavioral Therapy produced outcomes similar to in-person cognitive behavioral therapy, but bypassed stigma and logistics. And so far, that's what we're seeing with this project. We're seeing the overwhelming majority of our public safety personnel who are working with the ICBT net project team are reporting massive improvements in their mental health. And they almost entirely, almost 100% felt that it was worth their time and that they would refer a friend. This is a huge step forward because they can access these services almost immediately. They can access them privately from the comfort of their own home. And they can access them without going through their own organizations. And they can access them when it works for them rather than waiting on a wait list or having to, to potentially expose themselves to the concerns they have regarding stigma. We've worked with the government of Canada and we're working in Saskatchewan and in Quebec right now. We've launched this, uh, this, uh, this pilot project in both of those provinces and we're already working to substantially extend ICBT for PSP across all of Canada because we've had tremendous demand from the entire country saying we're seeing that it's working in Saskatchewan and Quebec. We have public safety personnel across the country who need this help. How do we make it happen that much faster? And so we're working on that right now. Broadly speaking, SIPCERT itself has produced a bilingual knowledge translation platform that allows access to research, treatment and training in a variety of different ways from webinars to screening tools that allow you to do anonymous free checkups for yourself uh, that you can go online as many times as you want and compare your own responses and your own symptoms to other people's. This allows you then to get free anonymous feedback that you can take to a clinician and that clinician knows what to go do next with those results. The social media and the webinars have been a tremendous and resounding success. Uh, I'm really proud of the teams across the country that have done such great work in all of this. And I encourage you to visit our website and take advantage of the fantastic research that's being transmitted and also have the opportunity to hear firsthand from public safety personnel, how they've benefited, what they need and how we can all support them better. We're building new training modules as fast as we can. And we're doing that in collaboration with a variety of different organizations, things like Road to Mental Readiness, making them available online so that we can better collaborate with the PSP and meet their needs where they need them. 
And we're doing that all as part of tailored responding, like we did with the COVID-19 Resource Readiness Project, a project where we knew right away we're going to need to provide public safety personnel with tailored supports for COVID-19, and we're going to need their help to do it. So I really do believe that we are having research with impact to fit with the series here. At least I like to think so. Uh, you'd have to check with our public safety personnel partners to find out if that's just hubris on my part. But I think a lot of the big successes come from us being persistent, being humble, and that we really don't know what their world looks like. And so we're here to help where we can. We try and engage in collaborative, careful efforts that are focused on helping people. We think all of that is what really makes research with impact. We have heard a lot of complimentary things over the last several years, like from the Minister of Public Safety uh, regarding the federal framework on PTSD, that SIPSERD is making a difference. And from the Minister of Labor in Ontario, that that difference spans our entire country. And from the Global Paramedic Leadership Summit, for example, the executive director who identified SIPSERD and Canada as leading the way with respect to identifying real solutions for public safety personnel, recognizing that we're in a many, many years long journey and we're just at the beginning but it's a journey very much worth taking so that we can protect all of those who protect and serve all of us. So with that, I wanna thank you very, very much and I'm happy to open the floor to questions and discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carlton. Um, I've, uh, I've had the, the pleasure of being able to hear uh, different presentations from you throughout, uh, throughout my career here at the university and uh, the impact of your work um, as each of us knows or has been supported or helped by a PSP member and at some point in through our lives and so we're all very grateful um, for the work that you're doing to support them. Um, Hertha, do we have any questions queued up for Dr. Carlton? And I think we have one hand raised here, so maybe we can uh, start there. Yes, Evan, if you can uh, press the space bar, you can unmute yourself and ask your question and I'll get to the other questions after. Great. Thank you very much. Just confirming you can hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Good. So uh, my name is Evan Bray. I'm the Chief of Police in Regina uh, at the Regina Police Service. And uh, I'm actually just, I don't have a question. I'm just going to uh, really respond to Dr. Carlton's last comment. Uh, he, he and the team are absolutely making a difference. And I can tell you, um, I, I can't speak highly enough about um, the appreciation that not just police, but but public safety personnel across Canada are feeling as a result of this work. Um, I think this is a real feather in the cap for us here in Regina and in Saskatchewan when we can see this level groundbreaking research that is happening um, and training and and all kinds of different uh, um, positive things that are happening for public safety personnel and they're originating right here in Saskatchewan. Um, that is outstanding. So I can tell you um, firsthand in speaking with members of our police service of our police association that um, in what is probably one of the most challenging times ever in police history, if you take the level of, of challenge and violence and uh, just what our officers deal with day to day, and you add to that the extra complexity of COVID-19, which, which we all are dealing with. But as we've talked about before, the frontline police personnel don't have the ability to work from home uh, and totally protect themselves. And, and in fact, they're the ones that are being asked to go into the community and do this level of enforcement. And then add to the complexity a real strong global movement, which has has really been spurred on by events that happened in the United States last year, but have really cast a bit of a dark shadow on policing. And as a result, it's this is not the, the most fun time to be in policing. And so you put all of those things together, it's a constellation of events that really, I think, do lead to extra strain and stressors for our frontline members and something that if you want to know what keeps me as a chief of police awake at night it's it's exactly that how we're taking care of the women and men that we're asking to do this job because we know that they're all mothers and fathers and husbands and wives and parents and brothers and siblings these are people in our community who who carry a heavy burden from time to time. And I think right now it's as heavy as it's ever been. So um, I won't take any more time other than just to say, I absolutely love and appreciate Dr. Carlton and their team and appreciate being able to sit in on this today. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Chief Ray. That means a tremendous amount. I, uh, your leadership with, with mental health has been extraordinary and I'm extremely grateful for the, the absolute support and for every, all of the police officer service and all the PSP service. That means a great deal. Thank you. It's my privilege and my pleasure to serve. And I got a couple of questions here before we get to the hands. Are there resources available for family members with, of PSP members which could help prepare them for conversations or identifying the signs of trauma is the first question. The short answer is yes. Uh, up on the SIPSERT website, if you go on our website and you search for families, there are tools there. Families are, we're, we're as far behind in those areas as we are in any other area to get very specific pieces. But Dr. Heidi Cram is one of our, is one of our researchers and that's her entire area of focus. And we're working with the Vanier Institute to build better tools, but there are tools online right now. And if you'd like more, if you have trouble finding them or you need more specific details, if you email the SIPSERT team, we can get you back more tools there to help. And please just know we're developing better, smarter ones as fast as we can, because we know that's a very serious, it's, a, it's an important area for sure and a very serious gap right now. Okay, the second one, is there information if the rates of impact of trauma for first responders in urban and rural areas of the province, are the rates of trauma the same? I love that question. So thank you for asking it because it's a really intuitive question. So the, we believe that the rates of exposure are probably slightly lower in the, ur sorry, in the rural centers in some cases, but not enough to be statistically significantly different. And we also didn't find that there were big differences in the actual mental health injury rates. And we think part of the reason for that is, so, I'll, so even if the exposures are lower in rural, in rural communities than they are in urban communities, which is still a point of debate, the levels of, of mental health injuries were the same. And we think the reason for that is because even if those exposures are lower, if you're in a rural area, the probability is the people being, that are involved that you, you have a personal, a more of a personal connection to them than you do in an urban area, right? Because it's, they're smaller communities. So your police officer or your paramedic or your firefighter or your, like all of these people, right? You're, you're probably rushing to help a friend or a family member. Whereas in the urban centers, the probability of that goes down by a bit. So we think it's a far more personal event in the rural section or pardon me, in the rural uh, areas. But it's a good question and, and we're gonna keep working on it because we do think there's special complexities that go along with our rural environments for sure. Uh, Courtney, you had your hand up first. Can you please ask your question, unmute yourself? Thanks. Yeah, I was just wondering um, with your crisis research, when you include correctional workers, are you working solely with people who are in the facilities or are you also working with correctional officers who are in the community? That's a fantastic question, Courtney. We work with both. So when we say correctional workers, we mean correctional officers, but we also mean community corrections, uh, whether you're deployed inside a provincial or a federal institution, or you're actually deployed into the community services. So we have data on all of those. And at the provincial level, we have new data that's coming out that gives us a more nuanced series of responses to allow us to better understand the distinctions that you're asking about. We just haven't got it published yet. We're still collecting in some provinces. Dr. Rose Richardelli out of Memorial University is probably one of Canada's leading experts in that area and she's been leading our field there does that does that help yeah that answers my question thank you awesome. please take your little hand down Kath, uh, Kathleen please unmute yourself and ask your question hi uh, my husband Paul Antrobus was a psych prof at the U of R and at one point he was employed by CP rail to counsel train crew after an accident uh, some people choose to commit suicide in front of a train. And he had some rather traumatic ones there that he was involved in. One of the engineers pointed out that there's a grid road every kilometer across Saskatchewan with a potential car, truck or whatever coming down the grid road. And are they going to stop or are they not going to stop? And sometimes they don't and they get hit by the train. So uh, I'm just wondering if you've had any contact with train crew so it's, you're you're absolutely right that uh, with everything that you've said there, and uh, we haven't focused any of our research specifically on the train crews or on the trucking crews, but they do experience the kinds of things that you're talking about there, uh, and and they do experience those kinds of deaths by suicide. So, 
Uh, it's an unfortunate area that probably warrants more attention. Uh, we certainly end up with our public safety personnel, though they immediately become involved there and that they're rushing out to, to help manage those scenes as well. So it's, it's certainly something we should pay attention to. Okay. <clears throat> I have another question here from Mike. Is there a documented difference of response between people that by the nature of their work are expected to be exposed to traumatic events and people who are accidentally exposed? My points, underground accidents are repaired by fellow miners, not specialized emergency people, may last several days in very different conditions and very difficult conditions. So I don't think we have specific data differentiating people who expect to be exposed and are vicariously, or pardon me, and people who are vicariously or surprised exposed. Uh, but I, I, I certainly take your point being uh, surprised uh, with an exposure or not having enough skills to help you manage the situation probably puts you at a significant disadvantage. Um, one of the challenges I think is though that although our public safety personnel uh, recognize that they're going to, as they go into the positions, as they go into those jobs, that they're going to have to manage challenging events. I don't think there's any way to possibly, uh, I mean, it's, uh, I think that that recognition is not enough in and of itself to help protect their mental health. I, I think we have a ways to go there, but certainly being surprised by an event uh, or vicarious exposures can also create mental health injuries and protracted experiences with trauma, like being trapped in a, in a mine and having to manage that situation. Those would also constitute as potentially psychologically traumatic events for sure. So in all of those cases, there'd be important complex challenges. Okay, Barani, can you um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, hi, Dr. Carlton. My name is Bhavani Sankar Paningrai. So my past career was, I am a Marcha Navy officer and then I came to Canada and finished my master's degree in industrial engineering at University of Regina. Then at that time, you were the president of Graduate Student Association, and later on, I was the co-president of GSM. My question is, do you have any research regarding YOGO, how it's helped to the like RCMP officer or Merchant Navy officer or firefighter? On yoga specifically, so there is increasing, there is research coming out of California on yoga uh, from a variety of different research groups. It's a complex intervention to assess because yoga does two different things at least at once. It provides the opportunity for engaging in mindfulness and it also provides an exercise related activity. So as an intervention, there's, there's initial data and initial research that I've seen that suggests that it does have promise, but that in and of itself, it's probably not sufficient as, an, as a singular intervention. So as an adjuvant or as a supporting intervention, possibly, uh, but we don't have the data yet to definitively say that it's, uh, it's not at a frontline treatment yet based on the last data that I saw. So I certainly think it's got promise based on the two components that I mentioned, but, uh, but we're a ways away from, from having real uh, evidence that it would be moved to a frontline treatment. And then another question is uh, patient who are tenosis, like hearing a problem in the ear ringing. Do you have any research with that tenosis patients? Sorry, I, sorry, I think I missed that. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Those patients who are ear ringing, that is called uh, the digital oh tinnitus. tinnitus. Yeah, tinnitus. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't done specific research on tinnitus uh, myself, but I do know that the uh, that it's one of the more common uh, claims that comes in, certainly for among military personnel. And I don't know if it's associated specifically with mental health injuries or not. I'd have to look that up. But I would imagine that it probably is because most mental most physical health injuries end up being correlated with mental health injuries. Like there's a, not not with a perfect correlation, but physical and mental health tend to go together. So that's Dr. Gordon Asmundson's uh, research uh, over many decades that's demonstrated that. So I would imagine there's a relationship there. And another small thing, just I want to mention you that I am doing a PhD on uh, in Guyatt University in India, and my research is e medi chair with the help of artificial intelligence, simulation, modeling, and virtual technology. So that is the diagnostic equipment. So basically people who are like, you know, firefighter or RCMP officer or police officer or pilot or navigational officer, before they going to uh, 
before they going to duty you can assess them about their psychological condition and so it's a one part of research simultaneously you know the way we call autonomous vehicle same way can we replace the uh, doctor but that is not i am talking about but i am in a process just starting that uh, research on in india as a phd thesis and sometime i may be have a conversation to you thank you thank you okay arjun can you please unmute yourself and ask your question um thank you thank you so much professor nick i have been following with your programs uh, psp net always i really like uh, and i want to stress on that you said like public safety person being strong is our community so so you guys are doing really amazing job uh, i am as a professor i work with a child protection worker um and we go through lots of like traumatic event with the young children apprehension dealing with a loss of i was wondering since the correctional worker are included i know you you started your program from the police and the rcmp now the correctional worker are so what about if we as a child protection worker can also get included and get the services uh, from your um organization or whatever you guys are doing there um that would be great for us like we go a lot through that very traumatic events and i know most of the child protection worker are the young fresh and they struggle a lot i have been there for 3 years so just um if something is going to in a plan or i can connect with my colleague um that's all i have a question That's a great question. Uh, it's a longer answer though that I think we have time for in a more complex one Arjun. So if you want to email us at the PSP net, if you go to pspnet.ca, you can email us and we can have a longer discussion about what might be possible. Definitely. I'll thanks for that. Yeah, I'll connect with you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, I have a question from Megan. Do you do research on how many of the public safety personal workers turn to sub substance to deal with their trauma not specifically not yet but there are teams working on exactly that question uh, what we have seen is uh, so far that at least with alcohol use disorder our public safety personnel in many cases are reporting lower levels than the general public we think in part that's because of the structural concerns it it is harder for them to meet criteria because of the requirements that they have with respect to their jobs so if you're still going to be employed uh it's harder for you to regularly be missing days of work because of alcohol <coughs> use because of the because of the way the whole system is set up it's more complicated for them but the specific data isn't here yet but it is coming there are teams working on it right now okay one from sherry l There is evidence coming from the Boston Trauma Center with trauma sensitive yoga practice as an conjunctive practice with persons diagnosed with PTSD or yes, PTSD. Yeah, there uh, there's teams out of Massachusetts, California and I can't remember there's another team that I'm probably forgetting that are doing uh, exactly that kind of work. So I'm very excited about seeing the research evidence that comes out and the new meta analytic evidence that they should have coming out. I think most cases they're looking at PTSD from single exposures, which means that we're probably going to take a little bit longer before we know whether or not the multiple exposures that our PSP experience can be managed in the same way, but it's certainly very interesting and there's a lot of promise. And from Mel, have you been able to tap into the research or partner with HI Highmark at the University of Alberta? I work with uh, Suzette Bramill Phillips team uh, on several different projects right now. So uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, they are doing work in those areas and in fact two of my postdocs are co-supervised with Suzette herself. So uh, and I'm not the only one. There's other team members that work with Highmark as well. and final remark from uh <clears throat> fatuma many thanks for this zoom presentation belgium cheers from brussels belgium and europe europe thank you very <laughs> very much oh well, we got somebody from europe watching us <laughs> thank you uh hertha for moderating the the q and a uh session and of course uh thank you very much uh dr carlton uh for for sharing your expertise and time uh 
um, again, and, and echoing Chief Ray's comments. Uh, there's so much um, to be proud of in the work that you're doing, not only for Regina, but for the impact that you're having on our, our country. And I, it's a, a great example of the incredible ways that the University of Regina and researchers and faculty members like you are having impacts here close to home uh, with people who are doing hard work for us. Um, so thank you uh, again, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, present to us today. Thank you to everyone who joined us uh, today. As you can see, we had participants from around the world uh, tuning in to be able to, uh, to hear from uh, Dr. Carlton. Um, I hope you now have some uh, time to be able to, to eat lunch if you didn't uh, throughout our lunchtime presentation. Um, a video of today's Research with Impact lecture will be posted soon on the alumni section of our website, which the link has been posted a couple of times in the chat. Feel free to share the link with your family and friends or to be able to, to catch on, on pieces if you weren't here for didn't catch the first few minutes. And don't forget to check out the University of Regina website for information on upcoming events in this series and more. Our next Research with Impact lecture is on June 15th, and that features Dr. Raven Sinclair. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sinclair is a 60 Scoop survivor and University of Regina professor and researcher. She'll be joining us to talk about the 60 Scoop, looking at her own experience as a Cree woman being raised in a white family and as a researcher. Until then, thank you very much again for attending. I hope you enjoy the lovely afternoon and the beautiful weather. Have a great day.